Well, first thing I want to do is show you a map of different ways that we can get to 270 uh, this evening. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> And so, so it's, 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 it's good to be here, and, and uh, thanks for inviting me to, to do this. This is, uh, you know, I, I feel passionately about studying the Bible and studying the Old Testament. I'm happy to, to share with you what, what, uh, what I'm able to share with you, uh, you know, whenever I can. Uh, how many of you teach, by the way? How many of you are Sunday school teachers or Bible study leaders or? Great, great. Oh, so, so several of you in here are. Uh, how many of you attend Sunday school classes or attend Bible studies at the church? Okay, that's just about everybody in that case. And so, so whether you're teaching the class formally, for, uh, formally or whether you're participating as a student and asking questions and, and uh, you know, making points along the way as, as someone else leads the discussion, uh, you have a lot to contribute here to the church and to, to um, not just to Travis, but to, to Christians more broadly as you can share the Bible with people. And anyway, I appreciate what you guys do. It's, um, I get paid to do this. So sometimes I wonder whether I'm getting all my reward on earth and won't have as much waiting for me in heaven. But you guys, uh, you're, you know, everything you're doing is, is storing up treasure in heaven. And, and so I, I appreciate that and, and, uh, and respect all that you guys do preparing to study the Bible and preparing to teach the Bible here. So this was a nice exercise for me. I have about half an hour to tell you everything you need to know about Old Testament studies, uh, to be a student and teacher of the Old Testament. Uh, and it was, it was actually a, a great exercise in that it forced me to reflect on what are the most important things that I can communicate. I can't go into any great depth about a single issue, but I have about half an hour to, to, uh, to mention well, what, what I've come up with are five tips for students and teachers of the Old Testament. And this was helpful for me to reflect on these things myself and figure out what is so important that I can't, uh, I, I can't even fail to mention in a 30 minute uh, discussion. Uh, so why don't we first of all get started? Well, I'll tell you this right away. If you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, the first five minutes, what I'm getting ready to do very next is the most important thing that I'm gonna talk about tonight. So if you don't listen to anything else, listen to the first five minutes of what I say. And what I'm going to talk about first in this five minutes is how biblical studies works. What, what does reading the Bible actually accomplish? What, what is the nature of the Bible? Why do we read it? And, and what does it do? Why, why do you read the Bible, by the way? You, you, can, you can participate. You can answer. Why do you read the Bible? An encounter with God. An encounter with God. Good. Knowledge. Knowledge. Okay, good. Inspiration. Inspiration. Yeah, all of these things happen. God speaks to us through his text. Uh, he, he changes the way we think through his text. What I'm going to focus on today is the fact that God informs us, informs the way we think, the way we understand him, what we know about him, and therefore how we understand that we are supposed to respond to what is true about him, how we're supposed to behave. The Bible, it, it is an encounter with God uh, but it's not some magical, mystical experience. The Bible works because the Bible changes the way we think. And because it changes the way we think, it changes the way we live. So when we, le- when we read the Bible, our goal is to learn what it is that God is teaching us in the Bible so that we can adjust what we believe and adjust how we behave in accordance with his will. So here's how biblical studies works in my mind. This is you. Um, it's, it's uh, maybe not the, the, the spitting image, uh, but, but this is supposed to be you. Uh, and we'll call him Homer. Uh, Homer here, as you see, ha- has glasses on. Uh, and this is the Bible. And when we read the Bible, it's impossible to read the Bible without some sorts of lenses on our eyes. None of us are blank slates. None of us, when we come to the Bible, none of us bring nothing to it. We, we bring a way of looking at the Bible. We bring our own theologies. We bring our own worldviews to it. Uh, we bring our own, if to use a fancy word, our paradigm, the way we think, the way we, the, the, the grid on which, or through which we understand everything. We bring that to the Bible. It's impossible to do that, uh, to come to the Bible as a blank Slate. So that's what Homer's glasses are here. So when Homer, he goes to the Bible with his, his glasses. And when he goes to the Bible, what he needs to do is adjust his lenses, adjust his glasses, adjust his paradigm, his theology, based on 
what the Bible says. So he goes to the Bible and then he adjusts. He, he goes back to himself and adjusts what he's thinking in order to line it up with what the Bible says. Now what's important is, not, is that when Homer goes to the Bible, he doesn't change the way he reads the Bible to fit with his prior paradigm or his prior theology, but he adjusts his theology to line up with the Bible. Does that make sense? So the Bible is where we get our theology. It's where we get our thinking, where, where we get our knowledge and understanding of the world. It's not, it's not something on which we impose our understanding of the world. And this is the way the cycle works. We go to the Bible, we change the way we think, we go back to the Bible, we change the way we think some more. Have, have you ever wondered why it is that when you read the Bible, you always see something new every time? Even if you'd read the passage a billion times before or read that book of the Bible a number of times before, every time you read it, you see something you didn't see before. And one of the reasons for that is that when you go to the Bible, it changes the way you think. And when, when the Bible changes the way you think, you go back to the Bible again and you're able to understand things that you didn't know before, things that you didn't see in the text before because you're thinking more clearly now. And then you adjust your thinking more. You, you, you polish your lenses. You clean them off or you adjust them. Then you go back to the Bible again. And, and when you do this over and over, that's how the Bible works. That's how it adjusts what we think, uh, and how we understand God. And again, it's important that we're using the Bible to adjust the way we think and not using what we think to adjust the way we read the Bible. And that's how biblical studies works. What I'm going to show you now are five tips uh, that I think are helpful in putting this into practice. This is actually more challenging than it seems. It's simple in one sense, but it takes work. We have to be conscious about this because if we're not careful, if we're not being thoughtful about this, if we're not consciously making an effort to adjust our thinking to the Bible rather than adjusting our biblical interpretation to our thinking, then we're probably unconsciously going to do it the wrong way. We're going to, to interpret the Bible to line up with our thinking rather than, than adjusting our thinking to line up with the Bible. So here are five tips on how to do that. Uh, tip number one, have appropriate expectations of the literature. Have appropriate expectations of the literature. This is probably the number one challenge for Bible teachers. As a matter of fact, normally when I, when I am in a Bible study or, or hearing a Bible teacher of some sort, and I disagree with what the Bible teacher says, or I think maybe the Bible teacher makes a mistake, it's typically related to this one here. This, the person is trying to draw some principle or some point from the text that really that text isn't intended to communicate. And our expectations of the literature, what it is we're looking for when we go to the text, what it is we think the literature is going to say, what, what we, we, the kind of thing that we think that book of the Bible might teach is what we're going to find in it, whether it's there or not. So it's important that we have appropriate expectations of the literature so that we, we are, are um, alert to the right sorts of things, the right aspects of the passage. I think this principle applies both to the New Testament and to the Old Testament, but uh, it's especially difficult, I think, when we're reading the Old Testament to have the appropriate expectations because the Old Testament is even farther removed chronologically and culturally from us than, than the New Testament is. And none of the Old Testament books were written for churches, for instance. They're, they're written for ancient Israelites and, and people living in vastly different circumstances from our own. Uh, part of having the appropriate expectations of the literature is understanding the genres of the literature. Now, gen a genre is, is a fancy word for the category that a particular uh, piece of literature is, whether it's, it's uh, a historical book or a legal book or a prophetic book or a wisdom book or, or perhaps an apocalypse and then other genres as well. When you read a piece of literature, understanding what the genre is helps you to understand what sorts of information you should expect from, from a, a text. If, um, if I tell, tell my wife that, that her, her eyes are as beautiful as, I don't want to get 
Psalms of Solomon here on us. Uh, but but, uh, but, but uh, if I tell her that, that, that her eyes are as beautiful as the stars of heaven or something like that, uh, you would understand that that's a romantic poem or maybe I'm reading the lyrics of a country music song or something like that. If you think I'm giving, you know, writing an article for a scientific journal, you're going to be confused by that because in a scientific journal I'd be communicating something very literally and not figuratively. And, and so having the appropriate expectations is important for comprehending what exactly the literature says. One example of this in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. Uh, David and Goliath, this is a story that, that has been, uh, it's the prayed example by interpreters of the Bible for how to read the Old Testament. And there are folks out there that say that David and Goliath is, well, David represents you and Goliath represents whatever problems you might have in your life. And so what is the Goliath in your life is the way one uh, kind of interpreter might deal with it. There are other interpreters that, that out there that say, well, David is Jesus and Goliath is Satan. And the story of David and Goliath is how Jesus beats Satan. And, and while there may be elements of truth to this sort of thing, the story of David and Goliath is found in a historical book in the Old Testament, which was not writing about Jesus in the sense of Jesus fighting Satan. And it, it wasn't even writing in a, in a way that's, that's um, allegorical, where, where David represents Christians and Goliath represents whatever giants you might face in your life. The story of David and Goliath is a story about David and how great of a king he was. And, and that's what the story of David and Goliath is about. And that, that's important. It's, it's, it's about Jesus in that the fact that David was this great king and was God's hand-picked king of Israel means that Jesus, the descendant of David, is the king of us. And, and so it does apply to Jesus. But the story of David and Goliath is not this allegory to be, to be deciphered, uh, but, but is a story about David and, and then it has implications for, for our understanding of Christ. Uh, so have appropriate expectations of the literature. There's a book, and I, and I gave you a bibliography there, or, uh, some suggested writings, and the, the book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Doug Stewart and Gordon Fee is, is a helpful book that goes through the Bible genre by genre, giving you tips on how to read that. Uh, tip number two, allow each Old Testament book to speak for itself. Allow each Old Testament book to speak for itself. I didn't bring my Bible with me tonight, except for the one that's on my phone. But you, you guys, a lot of you have your Bibles with you. It's, it's a single book, right? Well, that's a relatively recent thing. Well, not recent. This, this came about and sometime in the, the, you know, a few centuries after the time of the New Testament. But originally the Bible was made up of a number of, of different books. It wasn't a single book, but a lot of books. The Old Testament actually is a, a, a compilation of 39 books, 39 different books. There, there wasn't such a thing as a codex or a book as we realize it until, until a few centuries after the time of Jesus. So this was 39 books or 39 separate scrolls, give or take, uh, of books written in two different languages, Hebrew and Aramaic in the case of the Old Testament. Uh, and written over a period of about a thousand years. Now, all of the books of the Bible are inspired by God. They all come from God, but God chose to inspire these writings using different people writing a period over a thousand years uh, and writing 39 different books. And the reason, or the, the way that that should inform our interpretation of the Bible is that we need to be careful about taking one passage in one book of the Bible and lining it up with another passage in another book of the Bible and using them to interpret each other. Now, it's not wrong to do that, absolutely, but we need to be careful because different people writing at different times, although they may seem like they're talking about the same thing, sometimes they're talking about different things. And if we think of the Bible as a single book rather than a collection of, of, of in the case of the Old Testament, 39 different books, then we may misinterpret the text. Uh, so we want to interpret each book in its own right, meaning if you're reading the book of Ruth, then your primary information for understanding what the book of Ruth is saying is found in the book of Ruth itself, not necessarily in the book of Jeremiah. Not that Jeremiah can't be somewhat helpful, but the book of Ruth itself should be our primary frame of reference. Now let me give you some exceptions 
to this. Uh, there are certain groups of books in the Old Testament that are meant to be read together because they were written by one person or, or they, they were at least, least written together as a single work. For instance, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are meant to be read together. That is a single story. Uh, so there are five different books, but they're meant to be interpreted together. Uh, also, uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. These books uh, all belong together in that when you read Joshua, you can't understand Joshua unless you're reading Deuteronomy as well. And you can't understand Judges unless you've read Joshua. And, and uh, these books are meant to be read together, kind of like the way Luke and Acts is in, in the New Testament, as Dr. Taylor may tell you in a little bit. Uh, also, your, your first and seconds go together, First and Second Chronicles. Uh, go together, and Ezra and Nehemiah go together. So these are actually sort of multi-volume works, single works in a, in a multi-volume uh, format, and so these are to be read together. These books are especially helpful in interpreting one another. Um, but it's also good to keep in mind that the books of the Old Testament, aside from these cases, they should be interpreted in their own right to a certain extent, at least. Um, so, so that's tip number two. Allow each Old Testament book to speak for itself. Um, along these lines, you, you want to be careful not to read the New Testament back into the Old Testament too much. For example, uh, I don't have time to go into this, but take a look at Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, tonight or tomorrow, sometime when you get a chance. And, and when you read this, you're going to hear about a figure named Emmanuel, and your first inclination is probably going to be to think of the Christmas story. But if you read Isaiah 7 in its own right, for a moment you see that this was actually a prophecy that was to Ahaz, and it had implications and a fulfillment even in Ahaz's own day. I don't have time to go into that, but take a look at that and see if that changes your reading of the passage just a little bit. Not that it doesn't apply to Christ in a sense, but it also has meaning in its own context and has a point that, that we can miss if we jump right to Christmas, if we let the New Testament dictate how we're supposed to read that passage in the Old Testament. Tip number three, cultivate Bible study virtues. Bible study virtues. Let me tell you just a few of these Bible study virtues. Uh, first, I would say inquisitiveness. Ask questions as you read the text. Uh, why does it say this? Why, why does it say, say it this way instead of that way? Why does the text include this particular detail? Uh, why doesn't it answer this question that I have? Ask these sorts of questions of the text, and this will help you perhaps pick up on things that you might miss otherwise. Uh, critical thinking. Uh, don't just ask questions, but, but think hard about them. Um, you know, when you read a commentary or read your Sunday school lesson, you know, ask why. Ask, is, is this person actually correct when he says this? It's, it can be healthy to have a distrust, or there, there can be a healthy amount of distrust of, uh, of some of the literature that's out there on the Bible. So think critically. Now, by critically, I don't mean have a critical spirit. I don't mean look for any opportunity you can to, to criticize someone or to, to think, think uh, belittlingly of, of a teacher or of a lesson or of particular literature. Don't, don't have a critical spirit, but do think critically. I'm thinking in here in, in, uh, of the Bereans in Acts, where Paul would preach to them the gospel, and they would listen to Paul and listen with an open-minded uh, open approach. But then they would go home that night and look at the Bible to see if what he said was actually correct. And they'd check what he said against the Bible. And, and, and the Bereans are praised for that. So that's the kind of, of critical thinking that we should exercise when we're studying the Bible. Uh, another Bible study virtue, I think, is contentment with tension. Now, I'm your typical modern Western thinker. By modern Western, I mean Western Hemisphere, uh, not, not Western United States. Uh, modern Western thinker, where I like for everything to be wrapped up in a nice, neat package at the end of the day, and, and there not to be any, any tensions between different different ideas. Um, for example, if I read in um, Exodus that, that God hardens Pharaoh's heart, and then I go to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel says that God doesn't want anyone to be judged. He wants everyone to come to repentance. 
And I think, well, how does that work out? Does God harden his heart leading to Pharaoh's judgment? Or does he not do that sort of thing? Does he, does he want everyone to repent? And so I have two options. One is, well, I can ignore what Exodus says and say, well, God didn't really harden Pharaoh's heart. God wants everyone to repent. Or I can ignore what Ezekiel says and say, well, God must not want everybody to repent because he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I try to reconcile these things and harmonize these, these ideas that stand in some tension in my mind. I really want to resolve this tension between these two te- teachings. But probably the better approach is to say, well, Exodus says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and I don't completely understand why God would do that or, or how God does such a thing, uh, but I believe it. Uh, and Ezekiel says God wants everyone to repent and, and I don't understand how that relates to, to Exodus and, and how I'm supposed to put those things together and, and maybe I'm not supposed to figure out that. Maybe I'm not supposed to figure out how they, they work together, but I know that they're both true and I need to believe that and I need to be comfortable and content with that tension rather than, than forcing some sort of interpretation that harmonizes them that, that may be wrong. I, I tell students sometimes that, that, well, I get a complaint from my students in my uh, student reviews, uh, teaching evaluations sometimes, and they say, after Dr. Stokes's house, I have more questions than answers. And uh, I take that as a compliment. They think that they're getting me in trouble when they say that, but I take that as a compliment when they say they have more questions than answers because what I actually tell them is that a good question is better than a bad answer, right? I would rather have a question that I don't have an answer to than come up with a contrived answer that is wrong. So a good question is better than a bad answer. And a Bible study virtue, I think, is being comfortable with a question that you you aren't quite in a place to answer yet. That doesn't mean we won't be at some point in the future or that God doesn't have some answer for it somewhere, but, but, uh, but we have to be comfortable not knowing all of the answers uh, yet, which re- leads me to the last virtue that I'm going to mention, uh, which is humility. Um, we shouldn't be overconfident that we've figured things out. Uh, I, I, I said that we need to have sort of a healthy distrust of of our teachers sometimes, but we need to have a healthy distrust of ourselves as well. I'm not saying we can't have confidence. We should absolutely have confidence in the gospel and the truthfulness of God's word and confidence in the things that are absolutely clear in scripture, but, uh, but humility when it comes to the, those things that are less clear, especially when we perhaps disagree with others about certain issues, whether it's you know, a certain ethical principle or who you should vote for in the election or, or whatever. Uh, But humility is is a Bible study virtue. Tip number four, uh, read and reread Old Testament books. Uh, The pastor mentioned last week that he's reading through the entire Old Testament this year, and he he does that on occasion. That's a great thing to do. It gives you a sense of the the breadth of it. It gives you, or reading the whole Bible, not just the Old Testament, the whole whole Bible. Uh, An excellent thing to do. I've tried that a couple of times and failed uh, but, but reading through the entire Bible in one year gives you, gives you the, uh, a great perspective. It's also good to read through shorter snippets and focus on those. Uh, what I like to do, especially before I teach a book, is to read the same book over and over and over again. I was talking with Dr. Mitchell, who spoke last week, uh, this afternoon, because he was asking me what I was going to say this evening. And, uh, and, and I mentioned that I was going to ha- tell you guys that it's good to read and reread books of the Bible. And he says what he tells his students uh, is that before they teach a book, to read the book at least 20 times before they teach it. He he says he actually says 20 to 50 times. Now, I don't tell them that many, but reading and rereading texts that you're going to teach or just that you want to learn better, that's a helpful helpful thing to do. Um, Tip number five, use good study tools. Use good study tools, and there are a lot of great tools out there to use. Um, let me, let me uh, tell you just a few of them that I recommend. Uh, English translations are good, and I do say translations more than one of them. If you're teaching a book or if you're really wanting to do a close study of a book, it's good to have more than one translation because these are different. They're not all the same. By the way, most translations are good translations. Uh, sometimes people ask me, what's a good translation? And most of the ones that that Christians typically use are good translations. Um, None of them is perfect, though. Uh, So having multiple translations is a good way of alerting you to those places where translators disagree and maybe there's a translation debate or or, or some sort of issue with the the Greek or Hebrew text underlying the the translation. So using more than one translation is a good thing. 
Um, a Bible dictionary is an excellent tool. If you're, if you're doing a study and you come across a figure and you don't know a lot about this person, so you, you look up the, the article in a dictionary on Ahaz or uh, Jezebel or Aaron or Miriam or Amos, you can look up dictionary articles on these people. Or maybe you look up the word atonement or the word holiness. Or maybe you look up an article on the book, a book of the Bible. You look up an article on Leviticus to see what people are saying about Leviticus. So a Bible dictionary is a good tool. Uh, commentaries written by Old Testament experts. And I realize that this sounds really arrogant right now because there are books out there that are not written by Old Testament experts that are, that are great books. And I wouldn't apply, uh, I wouldn't imply otherwise. Uh, there, there certainly are books about books of the Bible written by people who are not Old Testament scholars that are very good. There are also a lot of books out there that aren't as helpful or that can be misleading. And so when I say commentaries written by Old Testament experts, I'm not saying that these are the only ones that are good because some of these can be bad as well. But one way for you to cut down on the likelihood that you're going to come across a book that may be misleading is to read books uh, primarily by people, uh, written by people who are experts in that subject matter. So I'd encourage you to, to, um, to look for those, at least have those as part of your library. Now on your bibliography, I do mention a couple of commentary sets or commentary series uh, that are written by Old Testament experts. There's the NICOT, New International Commentary on the Old Testament, and there's the NIV Life Application Commentary. What I like about these two sets is that they're written by Old Testament scholars but they're not written for Old Testament scholars. They're written for people who, who don't know Hebrew and don't know Aramaic, uh, but are thoughtful readers of the Bible and want to learn more about it. And so that's why I, I like those two series. Then finally, a concordance or some sort of software that can do word search, um, has a word search capability or function. That's really great. So you're reading along and you come across you know, the word tabernacle, and you wonder, what does the Bible say about the tabernacle? Maybe you read a dictionary article on it, a Bible dictionary article, but you can also look up every place in the Bible using a concordance where the word tabernacle occurs, and you can see, see uh, where in the Bible it occurs and understand the tabernacle better so that when you teach the passage where the tabernacle is mentioned, you have some more background information about the tabernacle. Um, and that is all that I have. Those are the five tips. And I think I've used just about all my time. Uh, but those are the five tips. Any questions? Any questions?